Hello, and welcome back to Zero's inaugural Racial Disparities in Prostate Cancer Symposium. I'm Robert Ginyard, co-chair of Zero's Racial Disparities Task Force, and we are honored that you are, have joined us today as we've tackled a lot of important issues that relate to prostate cancer and Black men. We're going to continue the discussion right now with our keynote speaker, Mr. Kevin Clayton. Kevin is Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Engagement with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And Kevin, we're honored to have you with us today. Well, Robert, it is my humble pleasure to join your, uh, your event today, and I look forward to sharing some words that may uh, touch a few people today. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Now, Kevin, we've entitled this our Keeping It Real, and that honesty and openness is so important when it comes to talking about not only prostate cancer, but the overall health of Black men. Would you agree? Yeah, you know, you know, Robert, not only would I agree, but I'm an advocate for keeping it real. And one of the things that I want to share with the audience is really, you know, what what are the risks for black men to keep it real? Or maybe I should say for black men not to keep it real. Well, you know, and the other thing, Kevin, is I have to say you, you've been such uh, an advocate about keeping this conversation going on within the black community. And, I, you know, I know you and I both agree that it is really important that we keep doing so. Uh, yeah, Robert, it, it absolutely is critical. And there couldn't be a better time than now. I mean, it, it, if you think about what's happened over the years of dealing with kind of COVID, dealing with the impact of kind of the social justice and, and social unrest and racism raising to the level. And as Pete, some people don't even think about racism as being a health issue, but it absolutely is. And then if you just think about how our communities have responded, it, this is now that if we don't take advantage of the moment where the platform for the black community is front and center on a global stage, to me, it's, it, it'll, it'll be decades before we have an opportunity like this. Well, Kevin, you, I got to tell you, you, you nailed that and hit that, or to use a basketball analogy, you hit the three-point shot there. So, Kevin, I know one of the things that you really touch on in your presentation is you, you talk about the why, and sharing, you're going to be sharing with us a little bit about the why and the overall journey. So, Kevin, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it away. Hey, Robert, thank you. And again, welcome to all the uh, participants and listeners of this segment. I, I, I want to kind of bring a story of, of the why and kind of share what, what, what my perspective is through three different approaches. One of which is thinking about my perspective as an African-American male, and I'll share a little bit about my journey. I have three friends that I want to share their journey. And I also want to make sure that I leave you with words of encouragement and hope. So some of you may be thinking, it's like, wow, okay, why is this, why is this dude from the Cleveland Cavaliers, the basketball team, talking to us about prostate cancer and, and community health and what have you? So with that, I would just share my qualifications around doing that is first, I am an African-American male. So the conversation hits me right front and center. Secondly, I chair an organization that is called Creating Healthier Communities in which we are focused specifically on the social determinants of health and the impact that the current environment does have on communities across the country. And then thirdly, I just want to bring to you a perspective of someone who used to have the exact same title that I have as Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion. I actually had that title as the National Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion for the American Cancer Society. So I'll just share with you. I'm going to share my story and I'll share the stories of others. So when I think about really prostate cancer and cancer in general and the impact that it has on the African-American community, I really address it from what are the things that we don't do as Black men? And I'll start off by telling you three stories, one of which is a friend of mine, his name is Bill. Bill is in his 70s right now, and Bill was probably the closest person in my life that I knew had prostate cancer, and this was probably the last seven or eight years when it was determined he had prostate cancer. So Bill is a good friend of mine that we would hang out, we would have great food, we would have great drink, 
we would have great laughs. And when Bill told me about having prostate cancer, it touched me in a way that I felt I couldn't have felt helpless. I'm like, Bill, what can I do? What does that mean? Immediately, the fears that I've heard all of my life about prostate cancer came to me. But as a friend, as an advocate of a supporter, I wanted to know how I could help Bill. So the backdrop of Bill is that he is a brilliant artist. And what I noticed was that Bill had begun to really focus on his health in a, in a lot more uh, detail, being more intentional about it. But there were these moments that I would see of depression with Bill where if not for really words of encouragement from his friends and his family, I'm not sure if Bill would have come out of that. The sense, since Bill actually had these, had these moments of, of, of really understanding, okay, I do have cancer, I do have prostate cancer, what do I do? How can I impact others? I've seen Bill actually find his why from a life's perspective, and I've seen some of the greatest work of artistry, of painting. Bill picked up now doing watercolors and things of that nature. So in my mind, I was encouraged because I'm like, wow, my friend Bill, he actually now has found his, his, his why. He has found his purpose through having the mirror of his life really in front of him. And me, as a friend of his, I'm always asking, Bill, what can I do? How can I encourage you? What can I do to support you? And a lot of the things that we used to do, we now do in moderation as far as going out, having a glass of wine or what have you. But my purpose in sharing that was I saw the roller coaster of the acknowledgement of I have prostate cancer. Now, what do I do? Another friend of mine, who I will call a little brother of mine, in at the time when um, this particular individual, who his name is Bob, he shared with me the air prostate cancer. He was in his late 30s, early 40s. Vibrant man, worked out all the time. And when I asked Bob, like, what's going on? Like, how, how do you possibly have prostate cancer? He had just been married for six years. He has two young boys. What he told me was, it's been in my family. And I'm like, well, Bob, if it's been in your family, why wouldn't you have gotten, well, I mean, have you gotten checked before? He's like, no, I, did, I, I was afraid. I was afraid that the news of coming, it may come back, that my PSA might have been high or I had cancer, but it wasn't until I went to the hospital with something else where they uncovered that. So part of me was frustrated. I'm like, man, you could have caught this a lot earlier. But the fear stopped him from doing so. I share with you another story, and this is somebody that perhaps you all are familiar with. One of my very best friends, and I say that in the present time, is Stuart Scott. And Stuart Scott, who Many of you know from ESPN, um, passed away, not to prostate cancer, but to another cancer that had basically hit him in his prime of life. And I'll share this story because Stuart, when he found out he had cancer, it was at a point where he was, everybody knew Stuart, loved Stuart. And he was determined to fight, which is the title of his book, Every Day I Fight. But I share this with you because Stewart involved me and others, his friends and family, in his journey and in his fight. And I want to now reach out to the families of individuals that may have any type of cancer, maybe prostate cancer or others. But what Stewart made sure we did was understand I have cancer, and yet what I want to do is gain all the energy I can from around me, and he found his why as well, and his why was that he realized that his story, his platform, he was able to touch literally thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people by sharing his story and his journey. 
and I was encouraged. And I would see Stewart sometime when he was feeling down and out. He would be coming from chemo and not have the energy to have a conversation. But just knowing that friends were reaching out to him was something that encouraged him to continue his fight. I called Stewart one day, and he was on the West Coast. And I'm like, Stewart, like, you sound like you're out of breath. He's like, yeah, I just came out of, like, boxing class. And I'm like, what do you mean? He started to pick up, like, kickboxing after he found out that he had cancer. My friend Bill began to live a wonderful life after he found out he had cancer relative to exploring more of his artistic talents. And my other friend Bob realized that he absolutely needed to change some things in his perspective of sharing with people the importance of having a conversation about family history telling others, and it wasn't like he went in a closet and hid, he actually became an advocate. So I wanna share with you just my own personal story. And about six months ago, I was going through and getting my physical and I've gotten physicals for a while. And the doctor said, Kevin, your PSA is high. And I'm like, okay, well, what does high mean? They said, well, it jumped significantly from two years ago when you had your last visit. I will tell you that at that point, I thought about Stuart, I thought about Bob, I thought about Bill, and I didn't take any of the things in which they had said and acted on it. I actually was afraid. I was afraid to go to the doctor because, I mean, to go follow up to find out about my PSA being high because of what the worst case scenario could be. A month went by. My primary physician calls and says, hey, Kevin, I see you haven't scheduled your appointment with the specialist we referred you to. Oh, Doc, I'm gonna get to it. I, I got busy. We had some games. Okay. Another month went by. Kevin, you haven't done anything oh not get duck we we had we, i mean COVID. i mean I, i'll get to it then i realized in a conversation i was just having with my daughters and it was so i have four daughters and we were just talking about man we can't wait until the COVID protocols over and dad we can't wait to travel and all the things that we do and what i realized was how selfish i was being and I was being selfish because my why for how, what I, how I live my life is always about them and my family. But yet my fear that had been really inserted in me over the years of what cancer will do kept me from going to get a biopsy, which is what was recommended. So I went, got the biopsy. Everything was fine. There were some reasons why my PSA level had increased that I didn't even know based on the what they shared with me could increase your PSA level. My absolute ignorance, my absolute fear, my pride, all of those things were keeping me from doing the right thing by my own personal health. Of which part of my story is, and why I was also like, not me, couldn't happen to me, is that I've always paid attention to my health. When I turned 40, some 20 years ago, I actually stopped eating red meat. I stopped eating pork. I stopped eating carbonate, I'm drinking carbonated beverages. I was doing all of those things because I knew that the impact of those of, 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 of saturated fats, processed food, alcohol, uh, carbonation, all of that has a negative effect on African American men at an earlier stage in our lives versus white men and others. I got a colonoscopy at 45, whereas uh, the majority population, they recommend that at 55, 60. 
So I was doing all of those things. But yet when I found out that my PSA had risen a little bit, or in the doctor's opinion, more than it should, I'm like, okay, how could that happen to me? Because if I'm keeping it real, we as black men think we're invincible. And we don't take care of ourselves the way that we should. And of course, I'm generally speaking, but I'm speaking from a position of me first saying that's how I felt. I had the stories of my friends, the three men that I shared with you, but it wasn't until I actually understood for my own self, Kevin, you don't live your life for yourself. My why is around my community. My why is for my daughters. My why is for a greater calling than Kevin. And I would just encourage men, as you're listening, that the sooner that you can get to your why, and that why is, why do you exist? The sooner you'll be able to transfer some of that energy that right now may be caught up in fear or anxiety about either you having cancer or not and can shift to something that is going to benefit not only you, but your communities and family. Family members, what I will share with you is this, and I saw this, that the energy that I was able to put into my friends with cancer came, was able to be translated into them being more productive and them having hope. And if any of you know the power of hope, that when you have hope, you can, tra you can transform anything. But the moment you lose hope is the moment that you leave your energy, your passion, and your spirit dormant. So with that, I want to cue up a video to share with you in real time for you to see the power of finding your why and how that will transform your ability to take a basic level of performance and energy and thinking to a completely different level. We can cue up the video, please. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country, and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's... You know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Uh, now, once you give me the version, is if. Uh, your uncle just got out of jail. You got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Wow, Kevin, thank you for your insight. Uh, now, as you know, this is part of a four hour discussion to uh, discuss racial disparities in prostate cancer today. And we barely scratched the surface here. But Kevin, tell our viewers why discussion, this discussion needs to continue and grow and, and include both men and women. Yeah, and, and Robert, thank you. Um, it, it absolutely needs to continue because absence of having the conversation, I don't, for me, I don't want men and families to hide from the discussion because of, of, of our fears of the unknown. And particularly with the, the, the technology that exists, the science that exists, and the progression of all the things from a medical standpoint, that if the sooner that we find out, the sooner that an individual finds out what their condition is, the chances are that in which a person can live a healthy, normal life and be a contributor back to their family or community. And the reason why it's not just around men and why women should, should know is because typically, I know in our, I'll talk about in my household, not in our community, but it's also in our community, okay. women drive the agenda in the household and, and they will make sure that we take care of ourselves and kind of push us to that, those decision points that we need to make. Well, Kevin, I got to also let you know, see, and I've been married uh, 18 years now, so it didn't take long for me to figure out that women drive their agenda, and I solely and wholeheartedly embrace that, and so men out there, if you're listening to Kevin and I, just know the women drive their agenda, live a long life, follow the agenda, but I want to also thank uh, the, uh, the folks who have posted questions in the uh, chat, and we'll get to them uh, as, as soon as possible, as many as possible. Uh, but Kevin, I wanted to, to go back to, to something that you mentioned about in terms of um, your pride and, and ignorance of, um, you know, that taking that health serious enough that you really embrace, you know, all of the things that go into that. Now, you mentioned that you, your daughters and your wife and, you know, everybody played a, a, a part in this. But I guess somebody would say, for this guy, He's got it going on. How can you not take care of this? How can you be ignorant to this fact? And, and I fall into that category too, but tell the, tell the audience a little bit about that. Yeah, Robert, see, that's the trap. Yeah. That, that's the trap. The trap is that we look at our kind of adornments and outward dressing and titles and all of that. Hell, yeah, I got insurance to go do anything. I mean, I can get physicals every, every you know, six months to a year. I have access to doing all of that. But if I think about how I was brought up and the messages that I got when I was growing up, it was that from a man's standpoint, we had to be a man. We had to, you know, we had to be invincible. So our health, as long as we felt good and looked good, it's like, um, I'll go to the doctor at some other point in time. Keep in mind, I go to the doctor. You're talking about somebody who goes with some regularity, but once I was told, hey, you may want to get this checked out, that's when I allowed my fear to overcome my common sense. Yeah. And it wasn't, and that's why the question around the why was so important. 
is it wasn't until I was having that conversation with my daughters around, wait a minute, Kevin, and it wasn't even about my health. It was just about getting back to doing those things that we love to do. And I'm like, if I don't take care of my health, if I don't follow up on this, I'm not going to be able to do the things in which my family loves to do. And therefore, I, that's when my why relative to my health was really revealed that we absolutely have to get beyond ourselves, our ego, our pride, and take care of ourselves. Well, you know, Kevin, what's so interesting in, in, with all of the work that you do out in the community, uh, and, and, and I'll share some of my personal story is that, you know, I did a lot of work with the churches in terms of trying to get men to monitor their health, uh, you know, get screened. But, you know, sometimes, Kevin, I ran into issues where, you know, as a people, as Black people, we rely heavily on our faith. And there's a scripture that talks about the power of the tongue. And so, therefore, a lot of issues uh, and things that we may have been experiencing, if, if I felt sick, uh, my faith tells me, to, well, don't, spit, don't say you're sick because, you know, that'll just manifest itself. And, and so, we also got that from a lot of our faith leaders that, you know, hey, you don't speak those things into uh, existence. And so how have you dealt with that out in the community? Because that's still ongoing. And sometimes people question their faith because, you know, they, they want to acknowledge these things, but their faith says, you know, be careful about the power of the tongue. So address that if you could. Uh, Robert, you're absolutely right. The power of the tongue. And that was really what I was going to reference. And so what I've done, and this is doing community work in churches like you're referencing, when I was with American Cancer, I went all over the country, and I'm talking about in, from Puerto Rico to L.A. and, and all over, and engaging with the, with, with the spiritual community, with the ministry, with the clergy, to help in changing that narrative as well. So as you were saying around doing these health fairs at churches and communities, it was changing the, the conversation because it is the power is in the tongue and the words that come out of our mouths. But if we change those words, if we have our spiritual leaders change those words, then it will help because we are the sheep that are following the shepherd. So what I'm trying to encourage is a new conversation. And one of the things that you, know, you and I talked about earlier, I just find it very interesting that we're having this conversation on the kind of the heels of Juneteenth. Because when I think about slavery, to me, it's not just the physical act of being in bondage, in chains. It's around kind of slavery as it relates to how we think. And those, those perspectives and those images and those kind of, kind of visions of, and thoughts that we have have come generation after generation after generation, where if we think about things such as, well, I, I mean, I'm eating healthy. Hell, I got some of that Velveeta cheese, and I got some soda, and I got a grilled cheese, and, and, and I'm like, yeah, okay, it's processed food. It's carbonated food. All of that is keeping us in bondage physically and from a health standpoint. So it's the whole shift, and now people are saying, well, you know, I'm not eating vegan. Yeah, I, I, got, I got a daughter. That's all she eats, but it's around being healthy. I, I can find a moderation of being healthy in what I eat and not necessarily have to give up those foods that I like. And now, again, technology, there are so many foods that still taste well that you and my daughter's done that. She has, has, has invited me over for dinner, and, and I've eaten something that I thought was, uh, was, a, was a chicken wing. <laughs> and it was nowhere near a bird, anywhere near that, that what I picked up. But it, but it tasted well. So my point is, we have to allow ourselves to mentally free ourselves from what we have heard and some of the myths, because that was also part of the, of, of the psychological slavery that was imposed on our people around how we eat, what we say, what we don't say, and black men had to be strong for our families and that you can't show any signs of weakness. Yes. Well, you know, what's, Kev what's interesting about that, Kevin, is that, you know, when you talk about diet and then you think about our history, uh, you know, um, you know, through slavery, a lot of times we weren't given the prime food to eat. We were left with the scraps and we made use of the scraps. Uh, and, and you can see how that really played a part in our physical uh, development. With regards to some of the, the work that you're doing out in the community, um, how are you addressing some of the food deserts that are out there and, 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 and getting the community to get on board? Because I also think that part of 
our mission is, you know, in terms of diet, not only do you have to change the mindset, but you also have to change the taste bud because we're so used to the process. How do we change the taste buds of these different vegetables and different foods that are good for the body? Yeah, and, and Robert, earlier today, and putting on my Cavalier hat, I was speaking with our team as we're getting ready to develop this fundraiser, and we were thinking, who needs to be the recipient of the proceeds? And what has broken my heart over the past year has been seeing the impact of children not having food and the impact of them being able to, to I mean, one, they can't go to school, but then secondly, it's like, okay, they have no food. When we started to get them back in school, they don't have meals. Therefore, their nutrition doesn't allow them to even pay, to be productive at school. We're talking about the digital divide and how we can provide access to devices and technology. Yeah, but if I'm sitting there with an empty stomach or being mal, mal, malnutrition, then how can I actually provide, how, I mean, what good is it around putting a computer in someone's home? With that being said, what we are focused on, and you talked about the food desert, is actually you know, partnering with organizations like the Food Bank, targeting the inner city communities to make sure that our black and brown families have nutritious food. So you talked about from a taste standpoint, and, and there are a lot, as you know, there are a lot of companies now that are doing things relative to you know, changing the taste and try to um, to try to make the taste as, as, as close as it could to some of the things in which we have eaten. And we partner with those organizations to make sure that, you know, it's not just putting a bland salad in front of a, a child saying, hey, why don't you eat that? Um, but that is a intentional effort. And in the city of Cleveland, where I live in Cuyahoga County, our, our politicians have, have actually claimed racism as a public health crisis, listing underneath that one of the key attributes is food deserts. And that is something that our entire community is focused on because we know that absence of having nutrition, absence of having a meal, that is going to impact our community in a much broader way than we've ever thought about before. Because once upon a time, as you know, when we thought about the, uh, the people who needed help from a nutrition standpoint, from a food standpoint, it's a homeless person saying, hey, I'll, you know, can you give me uh, you know, a dollar for, for a meal or whatever? So the mindset was, Oh, no way. I mean, that, that person who is down and out in need of, of food, that's who the homeless, I mean, that's who is, is the target audience. It's like, no, COVID was really clear. And I'm sure you remember the images of car after car after car signed up at the food bank. And we're talking about people that were making six figures from a salary standpoint that weren't able to get food. Yeah. So I think now over the past year with the, spoke, the, the focus being on the disparities in the black and brown communities relative to food, that we collectively as a humanity understand that this impacts more than just the poor man or woman on the street saying, hey, I'll work for food. Yes, they need support. Absolutely. Perhaps we'll stop passing them by now and realize the impact because it's happened to us. Very good point, Kevin. You know, and let, let me get to uh, some more of these questions here in the chat. Uh, Kevin, in your work in the community, you bring together folks from the education sector, the healthcare sector, as well as others. Tell us how working with all of these various groups is helping to improve the overall health and well being of the Cleveland community. Yeah, so what we have done um, is to leverage, and I'm not talking about the We the Cavaliers, we actually have leveraged our brand as a Trojan horse. And for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar, and I'm kind of going old school, a Trojan horse back in the day of the Greek wars was a wooden horse that was built and, it's, and, and it would go into enemy territory and the enemy wasn't scared because it's this wooden kind of horse that's rolling up. And then you open up the back and all the warriors will come out the back. We know our brand is strong and will gain attention any place in this country. So what I've done is I have pulled all of our community-based organizations, all our healthcare organizations behind us to say, we can get in the door, but we want you there to help us. So we have hosted in Cleveland, we've, we've hosted a convening of community-based organizations, and we have brought together the Cleveland clinics, the Metro Health, University Hospitals, as well as all of the community-based organizations that might be in the next community, in the black community, in underserved communities, in poor rural communities to say, how can we 
now that you're here, come together to develop strategies that will focus on the social determinants of health, let that be education, let that be the food desert or others. So it was the power of numbers. So instead of having all of these organizations fighting over the same grant dollar, bringing the organizations together to leverage the strength of many organizations under the umbrella of the Cavs helping them come together and then fighting this battle collectively versus one at a time. Yes. Kevin, I have a comment here. It says, such a great example of ways other cities and communities can do similar work. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Another question here, Kevin, is in terms of finding your why, how long did it take you to do that? Yeah, and I'll also ask the audience if you all could put any comments in the chat about what you thought about the video. So what's interesting is that I found my why in several different places. So my why that I was sharing with you that I found relative to my health, that was really when I was faced with, uh-oh, what happens if you actually have cancer? And, but I have found my why in my career. I found my why with my family along the way. So finding your why is not a universal kind of, hey, if I find my why around my health, then that means I found it for everything else. So you're going to have different dimensions of how your why comes into play. But as you saw in the video, once the man in the audience found his why and he realized, wait a minute, I'm singing for a different purpose than just the guy on stage said, hey, can you hum a note? It exponentially increased his passion. It exponentially touched everybody else around them. And it exponentially internally, it took him to a different level. So Directly, me finding my way around my, my health was when I had to be faced with, wait a minute, the worst words I ever want to hear is you have cancer, but yet that took me to a place of making sure that I connected at a higher level about myself and my health, not being disobedient to the spirit, Robert, if I could. Yes, you can. <laughs> and, and, and really focusing on something other than me. Well, you know, I Kevin, I think we do a lot of, there, there are a lot of training and some courses on, on fatherhood, but you know, fatherhood, a, a lot of times in some of those, those training courses, they fake, focus on the responsibilities, but you know, I really see addressing the why. And, and that's why I commend you for the video and what you're doing out in the community, because you, you take it a little deeper, because now the why explains all the things behind fatherhood and being a role model, model in the community. Is that something that you see out there as well? Yeah, so, so Robert, you, you're right. I do see that um, and two points I wanna make. One is that we don't have an opportunity to have these kind of conversations. And you know, I feel like you and I are just kicking it in one of our living rooms talking, knowing that there's still hundreds of people that are listening to the conversation. But the point is, men talking to men about these issues is a big part about it. So the finding of the why, I don't do that in isolation. It's now, now that I know what I know, how do I share that with others? How do I encourage others based on what I found out and discovered about myself? Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it, but the why organizationally, and I wanna make a clear distinction. When I took, when I, so I've been in this role a little bit over two years with the Cavaliers. And one of the first things that we did was to assess what is our why for doing the work. The Cavs have been doing all this great work in the community, but it was more around lots of activity, not necessarily, okay, what's the real strategic connecting point? That was our why. Then we communicated that to the community. So the community knew, oh, wait a minute, this isn't about you all just coming in and just kind of resurfacing court. This is about you investing in our community, investing in physical recreation, because that's the other thing we haven't talked about. The eating is one part, but exercise and keeping our bodies healthy is the other part. So we're starting with youth at a very young age to try to help encourage them through our platform, through the Trojan horse, and so that they now can see role models at an early age. So you are absolutely correct that it's, the conversations aren't necessarily happening but it, it's, it's, it's individuals like yourself and others that we need to be role models and talk about those things that we are afraid of, those things that we're challenged by. Kevin, I, you, you asked for some comments. And uh, so I have a amen. The why was powerful. 
Uh, the video gave me goosebumps. Wow. Uh, love the video. Inspirational. Finding the why is very similar, really, to simply getting to the root of the problem. Asking why over and over can really help us get to the real roots of problems in our lives. Love the video. So, so there are your comments there. Okay. Thank you, Rob. So, Kevin, now, the other question I, I would have for you, in, in terms of uh, the reach, how... At what level do you think we really need to, to make inroads in terms of helping particularly black men and black boys uh, in terms of really thinking about their health outcomes? Because for the most part, in, in some segments of the community, you know, uh, the hospital is only used for emergency purposes. There's no routine maintenance that goes on. So I look back at my education and I remember, you know, being in biology class and, you know, you always saw the anatomy of the female and you knew where the different parts were, you know, and particularly for me, I didn't know where prostate was until later on in life, you know. Um, but how soon do we need to start incorporating the, the lessons that you bring forward into to the school system? Yeah, so, so Robert, um, brief story before I answer that. Um, when you just talked about using the emergency room as kind of our own personal physicians or what have you. Um, one part of me coming with the cabs, I worked for a major healthcare system called Bon Secours Mercy Health. And that was a huge challenge for us because of the opioid um, crisis that was going on. And it was like, we, I mean, you had these converging challenges where you had people that were just randomly coming into the emergency room, but yet you had others that were in desperate need of help. But personally for me, I grew up with a, with a mother that we didn't have health care. So Robert, you show up at the emergency room, you're going to get taken care of. Yeah. So that, I mean, it's not just that we find it convenient, but being a resourceful people, it's like, okay, I know if I go there, I'm, I'm going to worry about the bill later, but I have a situation where I need to go to the emergency room. So I grew up as one of those, one of those, one of those people, one of those kids, Robert, that thought about the emergency room was where I went to get my, my, my health care, my, yes. my services. You ask, when do you start? We start in the elementary school. That's where you have to start. And it's top down, bottom up. It's starting with, 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 with parents, starting with kind of the adults and the leaders in the community, but also creating ways. And we do this with our, with our players. Knowing our players and role models, we'll have our players going into in the schools and having conversations with you. Uh, we have brought, right now partnered with with um, an organization that's called My Brother's Keeper, which is a national organization, and we have a health healthcare track built into their curriculum. You know, we're taking them out to farms to actually see where what the difference is between processed food and and food that's grown out of the uh, out of the earth. Because the kids that we're, that we're dealing with, Robert, they, they, if, if they see grass, it's, it's rarely because they're in urban, the urban corridor. They don't have yards. So to think about growing vegetables and seeing farm animals. So we're making not only the intellectual connection by telling them we're going to take them out so that they can see and touch what a real tomato looks like. Watch a chicken deliver an egg. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I, I got to tell you, and, and that, for me, that puts it all in perspective, because then you, you're broadening their mindset, because now they can make the connection, you know, and I think that leads to overall decision making later on in life, because once you know, the more around you and you have experiences in that reservoir bank of yours upstairs that, you know, now you're able to make a connection to different things, and it helps you with your decision making. So, and Kevin, you mentioned that uh, when you're starting with the kids, um, you know, in terms of um, some of the young men that may get out of high school, um, how are you following a lot of the young men at that point in, in terms of community engagement and health as well? Right. So two things we're doing, one of which is I mentioned these community-based organizations. We partnered with the Urban League, and of which I'm a board member of, and we are actually building a kind of an extension track of the program with my brother's keeper, where it's not only going through this as they're in junior high school and high school, but what we're focusing on is having the urban league provide job readiness. And therefore we are providing internships through our organization as well, job shadowing. 
And as they are, as young men and women are going through, uh, going through college, we have an opportunity for them to kind of come back and work with us. And even if they don't go to college, it's how can we find them employment? Because economic empowerment is absolutely a, a key to the success, in my opinion, of the of the of the black community, so that we are not enslaved to some of the some of the challenges that we have. That to the extent that we can have our own economic base and that it's not welfare based and it's not drug based, but it's because kids have an opportunity to actually seek employment. We have an entrepreneurial track that we're working on. So if someone doesn't want to go to school, but yet they have a brilliant mind, how can they create their own uh, companies and things of that nature? So it's, it, it's not just kind of a couple of years in the program and then kind of like you said, okay, when they leave high school or what have you, what happens, we're keeping our hands on them through organizations like the uh, Urban League. Kevin, uh, in the couple of minutes that I have left, uh, what would be, I know we talked about the why, but what would you ask the viewer and the listener to take away from this that, how can they start implementing these strategies and some of the things that you mentioned uh, right away? What, what, what are some of the small steps that they can take? Yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to mention, I shared earlier that I actually held a similar position within the American Cancer Society. Mm -hmm. And Robert, as you know, knowledge is power. I never knew what a clinical trial was. Never knew. I mean, I heard about them, but I thought that was for a totally different economic class of people. So I, when I was at the American Cancer Society, there were these things around clinical trials for certain strands of cancer, certain uh, types of cancer that if you were willing to enter in a clinical trial, then you would be on the forefront of new technology and new medicine. Robert, that's not communicated in the black community. That's not communicated in poor communities, black, white, yellow, whatever it might be. So the one thing is that I would encourage is from a cancer perspective, the families that are out there and even those that are survivors check into any of your cancer centers or the American Cancer Society about clinical trials. They are working on the next generation of cure for whatever it is that you're dealing with. That's one. Secondly, I would encourage a relative to the why is that once you find your why, write that down. I journalize everything that I do and I connect back to things that happen to me throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of a month, a week, back to my why to make sure I'm staying true to myself. The third thing, be obedient to yourself and your calling and share that with your family. So for you men that are out there and perhaps you had a, a wake up call by having prostate cancer, then, okay, what is it that you're going to do? The reason I shared those stories with my friends and particularly like Stuart Scott is that they didn't use this as a way to maybe go hide and, and be like, Oh, what was me? They're like, I have one life to live. How can I live it to the fullest? And the last thing that I would tell you, is to the extent that you can educate others, if it's at church, if it's in your community, if it's in your friends, in your circle, do so. Because we are only as strong as each one of us coming together to support each other. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, thank you for so much information that you provided today. Uh, pearls of wisdom for sure. Uh, and you and I will definitely stay in contact, but I can't thank you enough for being here today. Best wishes to you and thank you again. Robert, thank you. You're quite welcome. Well, it's now time to honor thing, uh, turn things over to Dr. Kelvin Moses, uh, and he's going to be joined by Congressman Bobby Rush, who is committed to reducing disparities in prostate cancer, particularly in the Black community. Thank you, Robert. We've spoken quite a bit today about the disparities in prostate cancer diagnoses and outcomes, as well as the challenges in accessing care experienced by Black men. But now I'm here to honor someone who has been consistently working to address those challenges at the systemic level. Congressman Bobby L. Rush has represented the first district of Illinois for over two decades. In that time, he has tirelessly worked to uplift the most vulnerable in our society and has been a powerful advocate for health equity. This past March, Congressman Rush reintroduced the PSA Screening for Him Act, 
a bill that will reduce barriers to prostate cancer screening for men at the highest risk of prostate cancer, including African American men. This bill is a key step to catching cancer when it is most treatable and increasing men's chances of beating the disease. No one should have to forego potentially life-saving screening services due to cost. Congressman Rush has also repeatedly lent his support to the Prostate Cancer Research Program at the Department of Defense, where researchers strive to advance health equity and reduce disparities in prostate cancer. At Zero, on behalf of men and their families, we greatly value our relationship with Congressman Rush and everything he has done to end prostate cancer. For all those reasons, it is my honor today to present Congressman Bobby Rush with the Zero Prostate Cancer Health Equity Impact Award. Congressman Rush, thank you so much. We'll be happy to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Uh, thank you for your kind words and and thank you for uh, this award. Uh, again, I must share with you, I'm, I, I'm modestly accepting this award. I am thinking that I'm uh, undeserving of such a fine and, and distinct award from such a distinctive group uh, and from you personally. And so, but let me quickly move beyond my moderation and say that I, I cannot express how delighted I am to receive the Health Equity Impact Award uh, on this uh, very day. I'm so proud to be uh, among many champions uh, for prostate cancer research, uh, prevention, and treatment. And um, I'm just, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you uh, on this day. As you said, no one should have to forego a possibly life-saving, life-saving rather, uh, cancer screening due to how much it's going to cost. That's uh, not a good option in this the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Something wrong with that picture. The rate of survival from prostate cancer uh, as you well know, is 100% if it's called early on. I can't think of anything else that's 100% <laughs> in our lives. Mm -hmm. But uh, the survival rate if, for cancer, for, for prostate cancer, if it's 100% if it is called early on. Um, and then on the flip side, 30% survival rate. If it's not called uh, in time, if it's called in the latest stages. Uh, 34,000 people, men, will die just this year from prostate cancer. Uh, so uh, we must understand and accept the fact that we're dealing with life and death issues as it relates to uh, this matter of prostate screening. Uh, and I had this in mind when I introduced the PSA Screening for Him Act earlier this year. Uh, this bipartisan bill will eliminate the cost barriers for early detection uh, for those with the highest risk of developing prostate cancer, specific, specifically and particularly African Americans and individuals with a family history of prostate cancer cancer. You know as well as I, Dr. Moses, that and others, that African Americans are 1.8 times more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer than white men, and over twice as, as likely to die from uh, this dreaded disease. Men with a father or a brother who develop metastatic prostate cancer are twice as the risk as men without a family history. Uh, COVID is in our consciousness. COVID is a part of our contemporary environment, our thought processes, a part of our culture. 
one thing that COVID has done is shown a bright light on the uh, existing inequities in our health care system. You know, and I just want you to know that uh, I'm very much attuned to this fight for help, uh, a fight for more health equity overall. And I'm particularly pleased to be identified with you and with uh, uh, your contemporaries as we fight against uh, prostate cancer and as we fight for more research dollars and more capacity to make sure that everyone, every male, everyone can be uh, tested early for prostate cancer without any, uh, without considering their capacity to pay. Again, I want to thank you so very much. I'm delighted uh, that you would think so highly of me. And I, again, I'm going to end this. I don't think I really deserve it. There are many, many others who are more deserving. So thank you so very much. It, it absolutely well deserved. Thank you so much, Congressman. We really appreciate all your hard work and look forward to pushing the PSA screening for him act across the finish line. And to everyone joining us today, you can help us to end disparities in prostate cancer by joining our advocacy efforts. You received an email today with a link, take action, and sent an email to members of Congress and asked them to join Congressman Rush and co-sponsor the PSA Screening for Him Act. You can also access that action alert at www.zerocancer.org slash advocacy. I hope you'll take a few minutes right now to do that. Thank you very much again, Congressman Rush, and back to you, Rob. You. Thank you to Congressman, Congressman Rush for all of his passion and commitment. And thank you to all of our presenters for today's symposium. You can see all today's presentations on our website uh, at the Zero YouTube channel, and we'll also be posting them in the Facebook uh, this week. I'd like to also thank our viewers for joining us. Zero's inaugural Racial Disparities in Prostate Cancer Symposium could not have happened without all of you watching, commenting, and caring about this project or this subject. And lastly, thank you to all of our sponsors, especially our premier sponsors, Pfizer and Janssen. Our sponsors have helped provide a special educational resource section full of great information on racial disparities in prostate cancer, trial and research information, and educational one-pagers. The resource section can be found at www.zerocancer.org forward slash disparities. That's www.zerocancer.org forward slash disparities. And on behalf of Zero, the end of prostate cancer, thank you. Together we can end prostate cancer and we will. Have a great day.